A crossover is a very confused car. Or maybe it's the customers who are confused and they are looking for a car equivalent of wash and go shampoo. Well, here's another crossover, Citroen C5 Aerocross. Don't be fooled by the C5 in its name. Citroen C5 Aircross is a crossover and it's not related to the C5 sedan. Perhaps one could say it's an alternative continuation of the C5 estate? No, not really. Anyway, sometime early in the 21st century, PSA realized their customers really don't know what they want. The French planned to sell C3, C4, C5s by the dozen, but the people preferred something that sounded like a weird sex game. Citroen's history shows that the company can work more than a dozen years on key models like it was the case with the GS. However, whereas people in the post-World War II France were drinking wine and eating cheese oblivious to the technical marvels Citroen had in the pipeline, in the 21st century there was no time to lose and PSA asked Mitsubishi for help. First, the Outlander was cross-dressed as Peugeot 4007 and Citroen C-Crosser, and then the ASX appeared in some markets as 4008 and C4 Aircross. This cooperation was as successful as France's defense against Germany in 1940. Citroen learned its lesson and gradually started replacing traditional models with interesting C4 Cactus, C3 and C3 Aircross. And now there's the C5 Aircross, which in terms of dimensions slots somewhere between C4 Picasso and Grand Picasso. It's slightly larger than Peugeot 3008, similar to Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace and slightly smaller than Honda CRV. But this doesn't tell you the whole story because in the back, C5 Aircross has three individually sliding seats and they are now slid as far back as they go. For a car with more than 270 centimeters wheelbase, I expected a bit more legroom back here. I mean, relatively more for a car this size. Now, perhaps Citroen is protecting the C4 Space Tourer former Picasso from being cannibalized by the Aircross and this I understand. What I don't understand is the single USB port back here. If you want to use the entire cargo area you have to fold the seats from the passenger compartment side. But then all you need to do is swing your foot under the bumper, wait for what seems like an eternity, so don't swing your foot again or the lid will stop. Come on. Yeah, because then you'll have to lock it again and unlock it. But it generally works. So the boot capacity is 580 liters, probably without the optional mini spare or with the seats pushed forward. There is a 12 volt socket here, but there are no shopping bag hooks whatsoever. On the plus side, drop the double floor and you can put your carry-on suitcase in vertical position. The parcel shelf is split into two parts and let's Let's do this. Uh, the front part fits under the floor, no problem. But the rear part is too wide. So even with these uh, small pockets here on the side, there is no way you're gonna fit that. I tried putting it across and it's still sticking out. It's just too wide, a stupid design error. You sit high behind the wheel. Citroën did not go Peugeot's way and left a regular steering wheel. As a result, it's less crowded next to the left stock, where there is also a paddle for shifting gears in the automatic version and the cruise control joystick. View of the latter is still obscured by a steering wheel spoke, but at least now I have space to push all the buttons in hope I'll finally set the cruising speed and distance to the vehicle in front. 
the instrument cluster is digital. I know some of the viewers don't like it, and I guess if you look at it from a German car's perspective, you may be kind of right. I mean, why bother changing analog dials to their digital image, right? But PSA is taking a different path. Different modes are not limited to just different colors. Actual motifs change and with them the information displayed. There is also an individual mode which seems to be more configurable than what I saw in Peugeot 508. Take BMW or Volkswagen. Their dashboards didn't change for ages, perhaps with the exception of the blue backlight era for Volkswagen in early 21st century. But the Germans have nothing interesting to show, which finds reflection in conservative virtual cockpit graphics design. Citroën, on the other hand, designed the strangest dashboards and controls you can imagine. The GS I mentioned earlier had a speedometer under a sort of magnifying glass resembling that of an analog bathroom scale. A modern interpretation is now present in every motif. Without virtual dashboard, Citroën would not be able to do it. In the functional department, you get large air-conditioned storage under the armrest, an average size glove box, a smartphone cradle, and a USB port, a 12-volt socket, and an optional induction charger. Door bins are average size. Infotainment system UI is not for the faint-hearted. I think it was coded with the original C4 Cactus in mind, and then functions were added along the way, instead of writing a new, better version. Good luck finding individual mode setup for the virtual dashboard without a manual. And the touchscreen controlled AC. I don't mind the two clicks, which I need to do to get it working to set it, but what I do mind is lack of physical buttons here on the top panel, or at least haptic feedback buttons, like Peugeot did in its 508. It had physical buttons here, haptic buttons down here. Now, finding the right button with a pictogram while you're driving, well, good luck with that. There are also these LEDs here that signal if a function is on or off. However, they're not very visible when strong sunlight is shining on them. As far as the engine lineup is concerned, you've got two diesels and two petrol engines to choose from, displacement ranges from 1.2 to 2 liters, and power output from 130 to 180 horsepower. This is the 180 horsepower 1.6 four-cylinder petrol motor mated with an 8-speed automatic gearbox. Only the least powerful engines still come with a manual shifter. I was pleasantly surprised with the 8-speed auto and an even more powerful 1.6 engine in the Peugeot 508. Citroën C5 Aircross is powerful enough in everyday situations. There are an eco button and a sport button next to the gear lever. Uh, the former you can't see and the latter you don't really need. I mean, for a relatively small displacement engine, C5 Aircross is fast enough. 0 to 100 km per hour takes 8.2 seconds. Real life average fuel consumption is around 8 9 liters per 100 km combined. You can get similar results on the motorway as long as you drive sensibly, because otherwise the 53 liter tank will not be sufficient. According to the brochure, C5 Aircross gets acoustical laminated windscreen, but on the motorway, wind noise is more than noticeable. The SUV boxy body style doesn't help. C5 Aircross gets emergency braking system as standard. Depending on the trim, you can get adaptive cruise control as an option or standard. There is also the optional grip control system, which reprograms ESP for use in more challenging conditions. However, this is not an all-wheel drive system. Based on Citroën's press footage, C5 Aircross will not get all-wheel drive, even with the upcoming plug-in hybrid. 
An uncommon option is the connected cam mounted here next to the mirror. It's basically a dash cam which automatically saves footage if you have an accident and of course it keeps recording what's going on on the road all the time. You can turn it off. You can also take photos and share them on social media because this is what you really wanted from your Citroen. The seats are very comfortable. There is also a massage option. Visibility is okay when driving, but the long high-ending bonnet makes parking difficult. There is a 360 degrees camera of sorts because it's 360 only by name. In fact, the front and rear camera view is stitched as the car reverses. It's a PSA thing. The really interesting bit in the Citroen C5 Aircross are the so-called progressive hydraulic cushions. During significant shock absorber compression, hydraulic stops absorb energy so there is no rebound. Under normal road conditions, they give you more suspension travel, thus making the ride more comfortable. I drove the Aircross and the new Range Rover Evoque back to back and around the city the Citroen is more comfortable. Doors cover the sills so you won't get your trousers dirty getting in and out of the car. Now, I often hear people saying they're getting older and they want to switch to an SUV because it's easier for them to get in and out. Well, not necessarily. C5 Aircross has almost 22 centimeters ground clearance. And for example, my mother, who is not a tall person, pretty much has to jump out, which is not recommended for people of a certain age. Now make sure you try before buying a C5 Aircross or any other SUV for that matter instead of for example a C4 Cactus. I recently test drove a ridiculously expensive Peugeot 508. Around 50,000 euro for an interesting and comfortable but impractical car which shares a lot of components with the C5 Aircross. This test car is highly specced and costs about 41,000. Even if I were to add some of the options missing from the 508, take into account Peugeot's adaptive suspension and Citroën's poor soundproofing, I still find it hard to understand the price difference. I guess C5 Aircross is just competitively priced. And what do you think about the Citroen C5 Aircross? Let me know in the comment section below. I post new reviews every Friday, but better subscribe and press that bell icon so you don't miss new episodes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.